Gia Gwit, hello. Welcome to the podcast series of the Center for Irish Studies at Villanova University. My name is Joseph Lennon, Emily C. Riley, Director of the Center. And I'm Jennifer Joyce, Assistant Director and Curator of this series. We appreciate the support from our many donors, especially a generous grant from the Connolly Foundation. Irish Studies at Villanova has existed for 40 years, and in that time, both Ireland and the Irish diaspora have changed enormously. This podcast series will reflect on these changes through the nine different academic disciplines that are taught through Villanova's Center for Irish Studies. Our faculty and students will engage in discussions with distinguished thinkers, artists, writers, academics, political leaders, and other campus visitors. This year, our central question will revolve around the changes the past 40 years have brought. Thank you so much for listening, and if you are in the area, please come to one of our events. You can follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, or email us at irishstudies at villanova.edu. Thank you, and and enjoy. As of 2019, at least 2.7 million children in the United States experienced the incarceration of a parent, a number that has grown dramatically over the last three decades. In this episode of the Villanova Irish Studies Anniversary Podcast, we will explore how the Irish criminal justice system's history, contemporary laws, and rights for incarcerated parents and their children offer a counterpoint to U.S. carceral policies that exacerbate race, class, and gender-based inequalities experienced by families and communities. I'm Caitlin Dittmeyer. Um, I'm a graduate student pursuing an MA in English at Villanova. I am also a former undergrad at Villanova um, who graduated in English and Irish studies. And here today I'm with Professor Jill McCorkle, who's a professor of sociology and criminology at Villanova, and also a faculty associate of Irish studies and African studies um, departments. Um, Jill's many years of committed ethnographic research has investigated and vividly captured the impacts of the war on drugs and get tough policies on female prisoners. The effects of more liberal visitation policies and resources for incarcerated parents, including new mothers and their families in Ireland, and the individual lives behind wrongful conviction cases. She serves on the advisory board of Villanova's undergraduate degree program at SCI Phoenix, and she has received numerous recognitions for her research, publications, and teaching. I have not had the pleasure of taking one of Jill's courses, um, but I know that her students truly admire her. Um, And in fact, she was selected by the senior class of 2013 to give their last lecture. Um, So I'm so happy to be here with her today and learn more about her recent research in Ireland um, and have a a nice discussion for you all today. So I'm going to introduce you all to Professor McCorkle. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much. So, like I said, I haven't taken any of your courses, but I believe that during my senior year, um, you were on your sabbatical in Ireland, and you were conducting some research, um, visiting prisons. Um, I hear that you're very big into participant observation and doing candid interviews um, to conduct your research. Um, so I'm curious to learn more about why Ireland, um, how, did, how did you think that Ireland could expand upon the research that you've currently done um, looking at incarcerated parents in the United States? Um, Hopefully, you know, what were you looking to find there and what did you find? Well, I spent the last two decades studying American prisons and American prison policy. And and for most of that time, um, the implications have been pretty grim. And it was during the end of the Obama presidency that we actually started to to really kind of roll back on mass incarceration. And really that concept of mass incarceration gets at the fact that in 1980, there are 300,000 uh, men and women, adult men and women who are incarcerated in uh, state and federal prisons. And that number in 1980 was considered to be exorbitantly huge. Uh, fast forward into 2016, and we're well over 2 million American adults. And um, so at the end of the Obama administration, there was an effort to begin to address in meaningful ways mass incarceration and to get men, women, and children out of prison. Uh, but that came to a halt pretty quickly with the 2016 presidential election. And at that point, I felt um, the most meaningful thing that could be done was to focus on issues around children, um, children who are uh, directly uh, impacted negatively by their parents' incarceration, even though they have committed no crime. And when we look at the consequences for kids in the U.S. uh, across every dimension, it's, it's just terrible. If you have a Um, incarcerated parent, you're much more likely to live in poverty. Uh, You're much more likely to have negative outcomes in terms of academic achievements, in terms of um, brushes with the criminal justice system, um, mental health issues, including depression and suicide attempts. 
And when you look at what U.S. prisons are doing for kids, uh, the answer is they're traumatizing them. Mm -hmm. And so I was motivated to spend my sabbatical year uh, looking at how other countries deal with the issue of parental incarceration to see if um, carceral policies were as bad as they are in the U.S. And I uh, sort of zeroed in pretty quickly on Ireland, in part because children and families have some protections in Irish law that they don't in the United States. And so I was interested to see whether or not the constitutional protections that Irish families have translated into a different set of policies in the prison system in terms of kids' access to their parents and and the kind of sentences that parents were subjected to. Mm -hmm. And so I was also, I was an Irish studies minor, um, and I, I was able to look at, you know, the sort of overview, you know, big picture overview of prison history in Ireland. Um, and we learned so much about, um, you know, the IRA and Sinn Féin and figures like, um, um, you know, like, or big events like the 1981 hunger strikes. And so I was wondering how that history of the Irish criminal justice system perhaps informed your own perspectives of going into Ireland and visiting prisons um, and looking at current situations today, and also in thinking about how that history and um, the current situation today um, might inform the way that you look back on the U.S. and what's going on um, with these parents and children. Yeah, I think that I actually didn't anticipate it when I went over there in terms of the impact of Irish political history on how uh, the general public feels about prisons and how the general public thinks about crime and about justice. But being there, it was uh, very clear that Irish political history has an uh, um, immediate impact on prison policies, most notably that the Department of Justice, the sort of equivalent of the U.S. Department of Justice in Ireland is, is formally named the Department of Justice and Equality, mm -hmm. which is almost inconceivable wow. in the U.S., um, where prisons are an outgrowth of, of the American institution of slavery. So in Ireland, uh, there's a much greater recognition uh, and awareness to protect the dignity of prisoners, and that is translated in all kinds of ways. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's imperfect. And of course, I talked to a number of prisoners who have objections in the way that anybody who's incarcerated would with respect to violations of dignity. But throughout a long history of uh, the struggle for Irish independence, at the forefront of that has been uh, prisoners arguing for their uh, political dignity. And, and those have been political prisoners as well as, quote unquote, um, you know, criminally sentenced or sentenced prisoners from criminal courts. And so uh, so today in the Irish prison system, prisoners can wear their own clothes. They can have their own clothing brought from home. And that is a direct result of strikes that were taking place in the Irish political system in the 1970s through the 1980s. So there's a way in which uh, crime, there's a recognition that crime can be an outcome of political events, that it's not an organic manifestation of bad behavior, mm -hmm. right? So people are criminalized as a part of larger political struggles. And so there's a recognition of that in Ireland. And there's also a, a very um, I would say the Irish public is, is much more sophisticated than the public in the U.S. with respect to drug addiction and how drug addiction uh, contributes to cycles of recidivism and, and reoffending. And so there's a, a awareness in the prison system, although it's one that, that does not translate perfectly into policy, but there's certainly an awareness that what they should be doing in the system is responding to problems associated with uh, addiction and drugs mm -hmm. rather than penalizing people for... <laughs> for crimes that are an outgrowth of those things. Right. And so that sense of dignity um, that surrounds um, or is more prominent in Ireland surrounding prisoners um, through history, do you think that is translated over to some of the rights given to families and their children um, as well that are experiencing incarceration? Absolutely. I think there is a recognition of both the value of children uh, and the significant role that the Irish state can play in contributing to healthier, un unhealthy outcomes in child development. And so, again, the Irish prison system isn't perfect. It's not a sort of panacea in the way that the Norwegian system, for example, has been treated. Mm -hmm. But there's a number of really interesting initiatives going on in Ireland. Um, first and foremost is the argument that, that children have rights when it comes to the sentencing of their parents and that children's rights need to be taken into account before a parent is sentenced and then uh, after a sentence before a parent is sent to a given prison. So, for example, a child's needs should be recognized in terms of where you would place a person. Optimally, you wouldn't put people 
in prison at all. But if you're going to do that, um, whatever the state's interests are in, in locating a given person uh, you know, at one of the seven or eight prisons in the country has to be balanced against the child's right to see their parent and have their parent part of their lives. Um, and so there's a child's rights perspective that has gained a lot of traction uh, in the Irish legal system and in the Irish prison system. And that's led to some interesting initiatives. For example, being able to spend time with your child outside of a prison environment. So you can apply uh, as a prisoner to take your kid to an amusement park and have your visit in an amusement park or um, do a picnic or go to a zoo or go see a movie so that the child isn't exposed to the sort of most negative effects of, you know, the architecture of, of confinement, mm -hmm. um, things that we see traumatized children regularly. Wow. And so you see that these visitation, um, you know, sites are places for socialization um, for these children and development as well. Um, and what about the U.S.? Um, what rights are given to children um, to have access to their parents or for even new mothers to have access to their new babies? Um, and like you said, in Ireland, be able to take them out, um, go to the zoo, you know, things that are so key to a child's early education right. and development. Right. Um, well, the U.S. situation is, uh, I just keep coming back to the word grim, yeah. uh, because other than the right to have contact, there is no uh, discernible set of legal guidelines that would inform prison policy across the states and across the federal system. So uh, parents and children have a right of contact, but how that is operationalized, whether that means uh, mail or that means telephone calls or that means visits behind glass, none of that has been uh, sort of form formally codified by the courts. And so what you see is tremendous variation in the U.S. And so a lot of kids, in fact, most incarcerated parents never see their children during the course of their incarceration, in large part because of the distances uh, that it takes to travel uh, from where the child lives to where the uh, parents are currently imprisoned and the costs associated with that. A lot of other parents just don't want their children to be exposed to the prison environment, which, again, in the U.S. isn't child friendly. Um, in contra and then in terms of, of mother, like women who are incarcerated during the course of their pregnancies, there's only a handful of prisons that allow women to keep their uh, newborns with them. And uh, there's been a number of challenges to this, of course, because it's penalizing the newborn yeah. to not have access to breast milk. Oh, my gosh. Uh, that, it would be inconceivable in Ireland. So in Ireland, uh, women are allowed to have their uh, babies with them, I think, for the first definitely the first 12 months, but it might be 18. Hmm. Uh, and they have special rooms inside uh, Doka Center and Limerick Prison where it's like a small studio apartment. Um, and again, in Ireland, there's the recognition that you shouldn't be locking up pregnant women in the first place. So there's, there's efforts made to keep pregnant women out of prison, period. And then in those instances where that's not a possibility, there's eff efforts made to, to ensure a healthy pregnancy, to ensure that that women are aware of their baby's development and what the mm -hmm. baby needs during its uh, growth stages and all that kind of stuff, um, so the idea of of separation is is a foreign one, right. there. Gosh, and and so I've I've read that you've been doing um, a lot of advocacy work um, and consulting work with um, a wrongly convicted life sentenced. Um, prisoners, uh, Cynthia Alvarado um, and Marie Scott. Um, Cynthia Alvarado, as I understand, is a mother. Um, so in coming back from Ireland um, and, and your visitation um, and interviews with women there who are mothers, um, how has that affected um, or translated over to the work that you've done with Cynthia and, and trying to advocate for her rights um, as a woman and as a mother? When I was in Ireland, I visited both men's and women's prisons. And a lot of the most innovative uh, programming for parents is actually happening in the men's prisons, not in the oh my gosh. in the women's prisons. However, yeah. um, I don't know that the women's prisons were ever as bad off as some of the uh, men's prisons have historically been mm -hmm. in Ireland. But uh, one of the most memorable statements that was made to me was by the then governor of Doka Center. And um, when I asked her, I was meeting with her first before uh, spending time in the prison itself with prisoners and with uh, correctional officers. And I asked her about uh, arra like arrangements for family and visitation and children and all of that. And, and she said, you know, I think the punishment is the sentence. Mm -hmm. It's not what happens in here. 
So I'm not interested in making what happens in here be punitive or be sort of counterproductive. Uh, and so that really translated into um, nobody's forced into programming, nobody's forced into to work programs. You know, prisoners do it if they want to do it, and if they don't want to do it, they don't do it. Uh, but I thought that that was a really interesting perspective, that the penalty is the time away from the mm -hmm. from family and community. It's not all the things that uh, characterize the U.S. prison system, the multiple uh, daily humiliations uh, that attend to just being uh, locked up uh, in in U.S. Uh, state and federal prisons. It's it's um, really notable. And so when I came back, one of the first things that I wanted to do was spend more time thinking about all the ways that we are uh, penalizing parents and particularly penalizing mothers when, again, the punishment should be the sentence. The punishment shouldn't be undermining the relationship between parents and their children. And so uh, one of the first projects that I pursued after I got back was uh, taking up a wrongful conviction case on the, on the part of Cynthia Alvarado, who is a woman who um, was sentenced in 2008 to life. And life in Pennsylvania means life, which is another contrast with Ireland. Uh, life sentenced prisoners in Ireland have their sentences reviewed every seven years. In the U.S. and in Pennsylvania, that does not happen. And, and so Cynthia was uh, sentenced for a murder that she did not commit or intend to commit uh, or attempt to commit or right. conspire to commit. And at the time that she was sentenced, she had a two-year-old daughter who was not taken into account and who has not, throughout her entire life, her daughter's 13 or 14 now, has not spent any meaningful time with her mom. And mm -hmm. so uh, one of my goals is to get Cynthia out of prison, but it's also to get uh, women out of prison who are uh, serving what I would call disparate sentences. That is, they're, they're paying an undue price for oftentimes very minor participation in crimes that men have mm -hmm. committed. And so that's uh, been my involvement with Marie Scott, who's also a mother. And in fact, okay. the vast majority of women who are in prison are mothers to children under the age of 18. Gosh. And so your work with Cynthia, have you been able to do interviews with her um, and with her, her family as well to look at, you know, um, what she's undergoing right now um, with her relationship with her daughter and, and the restrictions on that? Um, as a, have you been able to have the same sort of participation um, in her case um, and observing and interacting with her? So, um, you know, there's two two sort of distinct projects because the Irish project is a research project. Mm -hmm. And so there I'm really looking at how um, Irish law translates into a set of policies at the level of the prison system. And so the conversations that I have with staff and with prisoners and with prisoner rights advocates are all kind of going toward that larger research question of, you know, how does the law impact institutional policy and then what's the outcome for parents and children? The Alvarado case is different in that, for me, it's an advocacy project. Mm -hmm. And I was really looking forward uh, to actually doing some real advocacy work and uh, and setting aside the research uh, for, for a brief moment. Okay. And so I have regular conversations with Cindy and her family, but it's not the kind of uh, systematic data collection conversations that I would have, uh, you know, over in Ireland or, or in previous projects that I've done in the U.S. prison system. Mm -hmm. And so in some ways, it's a much more personal set of conversations. And, and um, I am in contact with her sister. Uh, I've seen letters that her daughter has written. I haven't talked to her daughter directly. Um, but yeah, it's in some ways, uh, it's a more, I have probably a greater knowledge about the pains of imprisonment as she experiences them than I've had with uh, people who've been, you know, participants in a research study mm -hmm. who are answering a, you know, focused and specific set of questions. Yeah. So, Professor McCorkle, um, what does a typical visit look like um, for a kid in Ireland versus the United States? So, that's one of the most interesting things that I uncovered during my research, which was I, I had... Before I went over to Ireland, I had just finished a study with Brittany Aiello looking at children's visitation in a jail. And it was actually a visitation program that was supposed to be progressive. So it was a separate visiting room for kids, intended to be child-friendly, meaning there were toys and games there. But in order for kids to get to the visiting room, they had to enter a waiting room with an adult caregiver. And then the adult caregiver had to hand them over to a stranger, typically a correctional officer, sometimes a social worker. 
And so they would put the children through a metal detector and then walk children down a long hallway. And the hallway was long enough that the child couldn't see their caregiver once the door, the heavy metal door, uh, slammed behind them. And this is the United States? This is in the U.S. Okay. Nor could they see their mother at the other end of that hallway. And so a lot of children, understandably, were absolutely terrorized. Mm -hmm. And the experience of walking between the sally ports where officers who were often um, not happy about having to escort the kids because escorting the kids means sort of trying to get control of, you know, their bodies and keeping Mm -hmm. them from running. And so the the officers would sort of bark at them and say, that door is going to squish you like a bug, which the children took quite literally because the doors are, are so heavy that it literally would squish them like bugs. Um, and so by the time that they got to, to their mothers at the end of this hall, a lot of the kids were crying. A lot of the kids were angry. A lot of mm-hmm. the kids were scared. In the visit, their mothers weren't allowed to accompany them to the bathroom, and instead they'd have to, again, be accompanied by a stranger. And so if you think about one of the first tangible lessons that kids learn about not walking somewhere with strangers or not um, not going alone to a bathroom, all of those rules are violated. And this was in a, in a progressive prison visitation Mm -hmm. programs. Other kinds of visitation programs are uh, much more difficult for kids because parents are penalized if kids, uh, you know, move across a table and there's not supposed to be any contact between an incarcerated parent and their child. But, you know, two-year-olds and three-year-olds and five-year-olds and seven-year-olds don't Mm -hmm. understand that. In contrast, I went to Cork Prison where the governor at the time was Patrick Dawson, who is leading the charge in Ireland for family-friendly visitation. And I uh, went through the visits, um, uh, he took me through the prison itself, and then um, I got to see the visiting room. And on the day that I was there, there were a lot of uh, women, mothers and wives and girlfriends who were dropping off fresh laundry for their husbands, sons, brothers, fathers. And there were also a, a bunch of kids who were visiting, some of whom were like little girls in their communion dresses. And they were just lined up single file, and they were... Yeah laughing and happy and they were just walking right into the visit room and that this was my first uh it was my first time in a visiting room in Ireland and so I turned to him and I said uh, just a sort of knee-jerk reaction I'm like aren't you going to search the kids and he was absolutely gobsmacked he was just taken aback and he said my god I would never search those children Uh, I would never you know sort of violate their own their sort of sense of dignity and Mm -hmm. safety by doing that and if there's drugs that come into a prison as a result, then we'll handle that. But I'm not going to subject children to that kind of intrusive search, which, of course, they're regularly subjected to in the U.S. Mm-hmm. The children learn as part of visiting their parents that their bodies are, you know, purveyors of contraband in the, in the mind of prison authorities. And so it was just striking to me how different it was and how, um, how much of a, I don't want to call it a normal environment because it's not, but how there were efforts made to make it as much like a living room setting as possible, that that families could sit at a tabletop and not have a, a divider, either a screen or a ledge, and you know be stacked up along a, a sort of row of other visitors trying to shout over the table to to hear and be heard mm-hmm. by their loved one. It's it, it's quite remarkable, the differences. Oh, my gosh. And were you able to talk to any children that are maybe adolescents now or even young adults um, who have had an, a parent who's been incarcerated for many years? Um, um, I'm just curious what the effects are um, of years of visiting a parent um, and going through that sort of um, searching as a, as a young child in the United States. Actually, I wasn't able to talk to kids. Yeah. Uh, one of the things... Uh, with respect to social scientists, is that we have to submit our research to internal review boards, Mm -hmm. and um, children are a protected category. And so to get the research approved, I really just kept it at the level of adults and uh, didn't ask to speak to children. And in the previous study with Brittany Aiello, we were able to observe kids in the visiting room, uh, and, and she was able to talk to some caregivers. I've talked to people who've experienced the incarceration of a parent uh, who are themselves now adults and are incarcerated, mm-hmm. uh, who have spoken very poignantly of the pain of the loss and the feelings of, of doubt, both with respect to their parent and with respect to themselves and, and you know, how their family fits in the world and, and um, the shame associated 
as a child with a parent who's away for a crime. And, um, and those have been particularly uh, moving conversations and ones that have absolutely inspired me to, to get involved, particularly with incarcerated women, so that they don't have to be incarcerated and, and away from their own children who are minors, mm -hmm. uh, trying to make sense of, of their families and make sense of themselves in the world. Yeah. And so how optimistic are you um, that we can maybe bring over some of these models um, of treatment in Ireland over to the United States um, and looking at reform efforts and advocacy work? I think there's, um, there's unevenness politically in the U.S. And so there are some states and jurisdictions that are uh, engaged in some progressive attempts at prison reform. And I think we've seen a uh, the beginning of a wave of progressive district attorneys who are uh, both a result of, of the American public rethinking what it means to respond to, to social problems, including crime, but also poverty and drug addiction. That being said, I also think that Americans are addicted to incarceration, that it's difficult for us to think literally outside the box. Uh, so while there's a recognition that that mass incarceration is a problem, and, and some Americans recognize it as a problem because of the amount of tax dollars that have gone to support it and the ways in which all those dollars are preventing us from pursuing other kinds of public goods like highway infrastructure mm -hmm. or uh, improving public school systems or responding to problems associated with addiction and mental health crises. There's other, other Americans who might see it as a problem uh, just in terms of uh, from a social justice perspective, the people who are in prison are people who are poor and uh, and African Americans and Latinos primarily. It's not the people who are the worst criminals, right. um, and so it really is not a meaningful response to crime in any way. It just exacerbates all those uh, social injustices that have been with us since our founding. Yeah, and so um, you've told me that really some of the sources of difference between um, the Irish prison system and the United States prison system um, have to do with not only national history, as, as we've seen in Ireland, and the dignity um, that can translate over to prisoners today, um, but also race. Um, can you talk more about your experiences in the, in the U.S. prisons um, and a lot of the discrimination that goes on with race, but also gender and class um, that perpetuate um, these inequalities and injustices? That you've seen with women um, and incarcerated parents? Yeah, I think that for me, the more time I spent in Ireland uh, grappling with this notion of dignity, which uh, virtually every prison administrator that I met with and talked to um, talked in ways that were, even if it was just lip service, uh, they were certainly, um, I don't want to say this, they were, they were certainly mindful enough about it as a category to which they had to respond to the Irish public. That is, it's important to preserve the dignity of people when they're incarcerated. And that word, dignity, is absent. Every conversation, virtually every conversation I've had with a prison administrator in the US over a 20 plus year career of doing research and advocacy work in American prisons. In fact, uh, if anything, American prisons are organized to undermine the dignity of men, women, and children who are incarcerated within it. And as I spent more and more time in Irish prisons, and as I spent time with administrators who themselves have um, poignant and interesting histories vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the Troubles and vis-a-vis -vis the, the IRA and, and other organized uh, political groups, it became clear that even when people were sort of on opposite sides of the fence historically in Ireland, mm -hmm. there was still that effort to preserve the dignity of prisoners, which I think is a product of long political struggles in Ireland. Those struggles exist in the US, but most Americans remain uh, completely ignorant of them. Mm -hmm. And I think that that has everything to do with the history of race in the United States and everything to do with racial inequality in the US and the fact that prisons really are an outgrowth of slavery and prisons are really a tool of shoring up systems of uh, race inequality, but also obviously class inequality. And so. Um, you know, there's been any number of studies across any number of criminal justice domains, uh, but, you know, most notably, for example, the death penalty. What's the strongest predictor of who gets the death penalty in the United States? It's not that 
that the murder that you're convicted of is the most egregious murder, which is what most Americans think. It's the like heinous murders or the multiple murders that are um, sentenced to die. That's not it at all. The strongest predictor of who gets the death penalty in the U.S. is the racial combination, black defendant, white victim. Uh, 11 times more likely, depending on which data set you're looking at, 11 times more likely than any other racial combination. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we can look at that model for other kinds of crimes, and it holds up again and again and again and again. Mm -hmm. And um, so looking at a country that has had, in the form of Ireland, that has had political strife, where people have taken up arms against one another, and yet there's still, uh, there's still a baseline respect for the dignity of people across political divides and across religious divides, to me, speaks volumes about race. And it's not that there's a sort of absence of race in Ireland. Um, there's ongoing issues in the Irish criminal justice system about the traveling community. There's issues with respect to um, people who are in violation of, of immigration laws. But the majority of people in the Irish prison system are... Irish people, mm -hmm. and um, and they're treated very differently than than American prisoners. Yeah, and and gosh, that makes me think so much about um, you know figures um, that have been so commemorated, um, particularly involved with um, the IRA and um, 1981 hunger strikes and fights for independence and civil war. Um, you know all the violence surrounding that, um, and it seems that protests and um, and efforts for reform and and struggles here in the United States um, by these by prisoners throughout history there's so much silencing um, you hear very little I mean I don't I can't even think of many commemoration stories or or acts um, that bring to light the same um, maybe you know shared dignity um, that Ireland has for its prisoners. Um, I think that is very much missing here in the United States. Um, and so I've heard that you spent some time, um, you've been to so many prisons. Um, <laughs> I might have the yeah. U.S. record for uh, yeah. prison, most prison visits across the U.S. Oh my gosh. <laughs> well, I'm, and your students have so much to say about um, the stories that you have and what you've learned. Um, and one in particular that struck out to me from a former student of yours um, is your visit to Angola, Louisiana State Penitentiary. Um, and I was looking at more information about that over the weekend and completely horror struck and everything you've said about perpetuating slavery um, and that seems so so present um, in arising from this particular prison. Um, can you talk more about your visit to Angola and what you learned from that and how it also has informed your work today? Well Angola actually uh, makes the point uh, really well which Angola prison in Louisiana is a former slave plantation and so so Angola just seamlessly transitions from being a plantation with chattel slavery to being a maximum security prison. And in Angola, generations of families are there as incarcerated people or they're there as correctional officers and, and prison staff. Literally, generations are locked into it in the way that they would have been locked into it a couple of hundred years ago. And... Um, you know, Angola, it, it's it's interesting in that um, they engage in practices that in the north uh, would be inconceivable. So Angola runs a prison rodeo a couple of times a year. And people come from all over the south to – and they bring their kids to participate in the rodeo. And so I had heard about the rodeo forever but had never been to it. And I was um, interested in going because I thought, well, you know, there's a way in which – Okay, it's this sort of cultural event where you bring your kids and then you're watching incarcerated men engage in, you know, sort of high-end cowboy skills that we associate with kind of mythical mm -hmm. heroes of the American West. And so I thought that was sort of an interesting juxtaposition where so much of American culture is about uh, narrating the danger of, of prisoners, particularly incarcerated men. And so what does it mean to have... Uh, incarcerated men displaying skills that, that Americans, you know, sort of value, like cattle uh, roping or yeah. whatever. But as it turns out, the Angola Rodeo doesn't use prisoners in highly skilled rodeo events. So for that, it's, it's participants who are not incarcerated. It's participants who would show up at any rodeo in the South. 
Instead, uh, incarcerated participants serve as um, targets or bait for bulls. So there's a, a game called um, convict poker, where there's little poker tables that are set up in this arena. And uh, there's four men sitting around the tables, you know, symbolically playing poker. And then they release a bull or bulls into the ring. And the goal, the winner, is to sit at the table as long as possible before fleeing from the bull. And the bulls have already been ramped up. So they take their balls and put them in some kind of strap, which I gather is very painful for the bulls. Yeah, so when the bulls come tearing out of <laughs> the pen, they're, they're ready pissed. to kill. Yeah, they're pissed. They're yeah. ready to kill somebody. And so, and so it's game after game after game where incarcerated men's bodies are just sort of targets mm-hmm. for the sort of violence of the bull. So not cowboys, not, you know, the victor hopefully that comes out on top, but the body and, and the prop. Right. Yeah. They're props to be destroyed. Um, and and that the day that I was there in Angola, there was a man who uh, the last game in the rodeo is a game where um, prisoners are actually incentivized to approach the bull. And so there's a um, like a button that is put on the bull's forehead. And in Angola, at the time, they make about 14 cents an hour. They're required by law to labor, and they labor in the fields just like generations of African Americans before them. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they make maybe 14 cents, and you know, you're familiar with the price of a stamp or a phone call is even more. And so for $25, like you'll get $25 if you get this button off the bull's forehead. And so it's the biggest bull of the day. Again, the bull is in pain. And now, instead of fleeing the bull, the bull is encircled by, you know, maybe 50 men, maybe 75 men who are trying to earn money to send it back home or to have contact with their children and family members. Uh, And so that day, a bull gored a man and flipped him up over his, over the body of the bull. And when he landed, it was, he landed lifelessly. And no one came to get him. It was other prisoners who waited and kind of crawled down and had to hoist him up over this fence, which was probably, I don't know, it was like maybe 12 feet tall. And again, um, n- no effort on the part of prison staff to prevent it. In fact, at the end, uh, they doubled the prize money for the next day since no one won. Whoa. Oh, my yeah. gosh. I'm like sickened by this. And it's like bringing back the spectacle of punishment um, and in looking at the history of punishment, you know, and um, theorists like Foucault, you know, the power is now insidiously running secretly through the institution. But in events like that, um, that are invisible to anybody that doesn't go to the rodeo, um, but it becomes a spectacle yet again um, for the people who go and, and visit this and see this event. Um, yeah, it's it's, it's sort of this um, it's sort of this reversal on Foucault, yeah, right? Because it's inviting right. the public in to the the kind of spectacles that we would have seen, you know, in France in the seventeen yeah, hundreds or whatever. Yeah, seeing this, like, yeah, that's horrifying. Um, oh my gosh! <laughs> wow. Yeah. Gosh, and and so, yeah, that um, and so like, what, what um, freedom or I guess freedom isn't even really the word, but is this mandatory for these prisoners to partake in this rodeo? Or is it is it the incentive of being able to earn money for the chance of, you know, bringing it home? Um, what what do they what do they have that they can say no or yes to this? Yeah, I mean, they volunteer, quote unquote. Yeah, um, but it's not voluntary when uh, when you're incarcerated and when you have no means of contacting your family because it, you would have to work several hours just to afford the price of a stamp. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, that's yeah. – and I haven't – I haven't – that was my first and only time at the rodeo, and I don't know if it's changed. That was under um, a uh, particular warden, and I'm – Earl Kane, uh, who's no longer the warden, who was prosecuted for a kickback scheme, I believe, 
in Louisiana. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I don't know that the uh, that the rodeo survives in the same form yeah. that it did at the time. Okay. Wow. And so, I mean, this all speaks to shame as well in, in prisons to such an extreme extent in, in this case. Um, and you've spent a lot of time with um, especially women um, and going into women's prisons. Um, what kind of uh, shame do you think or humiliation is experienced by these women, particularly of, um, you know, African-American women um, or Latina women in prison um, and women who are mothers, too. Well, you might have seen there was an effort to just get um, personal hygiene products associated with menstruation into women's prisons in the federal system, uh, which women still don't in most facilities still don't have access to. They have to buy them out of their uh, commissary accounts, for which it means that you are then sacrificing uh, calls to family in order to buy products. There, there have been um, numerous stories about restrictions on uh, like how many rolls of toilet paper you can have. All of these things, which just at a basic human level, right. um, women are denied and routinely denied. There's mm-hmm. other stories where um, personal hygiene products have been withheld in exchange for sexual favors to correction staff. And so we still don't have basic human rights being recognized in in American prisons in general. I think this gets narrated even less in women's prisons. As you know, there's a lot of women's prisons where uh, women continue to be shackled during uh, labor and delivery. Mm -hmm. Uh, The infant mortality rate in prisons is huge, and it's a function of the fact that American prisons don't provide basic nutritional, they don't meet basic nutritional guidelines uh, for pregnant women. They often don't provide, um, you know, pre prenatal checks or pregnancy vitamins. Mm. Any of the kind of stuff that is uh, standard fare elsewhere is absent in, in prisons. And then just in terms of, uh, you know, access to children and, and interactions with children, it's uh, women in Pennsylvania, in order to have a visit, have to be strip searched, and then they change out of their normal prison uniform into the sort of ill-fitting jumpsuit to go in on their visit. But when they come out of the visit, they are once again strip searched for contraband. So every single visit with a child is marred by this sort of intrusive and humiliating search. Hmm. But it's also the case that parents are disciplined in front of their children, often for, you know, things that correctional officers wouldn't even be in a position to, to have a commentary on. And uh, so in, in the study with Brittany Aiello, we had a, a incarcerated mother who was joking uh, with her five-year-old about whether or not his father, who was his primary caretaker at that point, was doing the vacuuming. And a correctional officer came over and reprimanded the mother. And so it does all of these strange things with respect to parental authority Mm -hmm. and the relationship between a parent and child. People aren't allowed to, incarcerated people can't give anything to their visitors and visitors can't bring anything into their parents. So if a child wanted to bring his or her mother, you know, a drawing that they did in school, you're not allowed to do that. Um, and, And, you know, we saw mothers try to braid their child's hair and give the child a hair tie. That's also... Uh, a rule violation oh for gosh. which they can lose their visits. So there's just a whole host of stuff that is some of which is big and some of which is little, mm-hmm. but all of it adds up to um, to just uh, uh, all these infringements on dignity, all these infringements in ter- with respect to the autonomy of families and the, and the privacy that families should enjoy in their relations with one another that are inexcusable, that are really human rights violations. Hmm. And speaking of women, um, I hear that you're teaching a course next semester. Um, It's hashtag Say Her Name, Gender, Race, and Social Justice. Um, It's a seminar course. Um, And so can you tell us more about this class? I mean, I I don't know how much you can (laughs) say for your students that are going to be taking it and are are eagerly awaiting for it. Um, But And also, with courses like this, how do you involve your students? And what are some of the big takeaways that you want your students to to be able to walk out of the class and, and say or be able to do and, and be an active, um, you know, person who can maybe get involved um, in some of these issues of injustice? 
Yeah, well, I'm really excited for this course. It is a direct outgrowth of the hashtag Say Her Name movement, which is part of the broader uh, Black Lives Matter movement. Mm -hmm. And Say Her Name is really an effort to uh, to recognize that black women and girls are themselves the victim of police violence. Uh, and so I want the course to um, move from that movement and then think about the critiques in particular that black women have offered of white feminism and white feminist theories. And so um, so we'll start with that and then begin looking at uh, you know, sort of meaningful efforts to think about state violence in intersectional ways. And so we'll begin with that, but then we'll also look at state violence more broadly conceived. And so not only uh, police violence as it affects black women and girls, but also the violence of the contemporary prison system and a lot of the things that you and I have just been talking about here. But we'll also move back and forth um, from, you know, present day to different historical moments of and instances of state violence in the U.S. And so we'll look at slavery. We'll look at um, internment of Japanese citizens in, in the midst of, of World War. And um, and then we'll also consider uh, sort of contemporary uh, moments in, in Me Too as well. And so I um, am so looking forward to this yeah. course. So it'll be and it, it's for me, it's an opportunity to do. Uh, a lot of feminist theory and a lot of not just social science, but we'll also be engaging in reading some um, great novels and we'll be mm -hmm. engaging with different songs. I love to toss Nina Simone in there along with Beyonce yeah. because uh, these issues and the issues of state violence uh, directed at black women and girls aren't new. Mm -hmm. uh, again, they have been around forever. And so I think part of thinking about the contemporary moment is thinking about how it links um, in, in significant ways to, to the past. So uh, we'll also in that class take up uh, some of the work that students in my sociology of punishment class are doing, which is we're helping incarcerated women, women who are in uh, Muncie prison, Philadelphia area women who are doing life and near life sentences in Muncie prison. We'll be looking at their cases to see if uh, we can make an argument on appeal, whether they have outstanding appellate issues that they haven't received assistance on to date, which is really what the students did in the Alvarado case, uh, and they did so successfully. Um, and for women who've exhausted their appeals, we'll also be looking at helping them prepare commutation packages, uh, because I'm currently working with the lieutenant governor's office to help more women get in front of uh, the uh, parole board and the commutation board and have successful petitions so that we can start getting uh, women often who are grandmothers at this point mm -hmm. uh, out of prison. Yeah, wow. And and so, I mean, I'm, I'm circling back um, maybe somewhere I should have started, but where, when you, so you were a student at Bucknell um, and, you know, you've been, you've been dedicating so many years to to your research and advocacy work. Um, what had inspired you or has been driving you um, to not only learn about prisons, um, but be an active advocate and consultant for individual lives in prisons, and also a teacher, um, somebody that is, is working closely with students and helping and shaping them in and, and ways that they can see themselves getting involved in projects like the ones that you are currently in. What has maybe driven that or inspired that in you? I think in part, um, I was a kid when I was in junior high uh, and in high school, uh, found myself in, in a little bit of uh, trouble here and there of in terms of sort of garden variety, mm -hmm. juvenile delinquency, and, um, and having some brushes with uh, corrupt police officers. Um, in part, I had uh, an officer wrongfully say that he smelled marijuana in a car where there was no marijuana in order to uh, get a, an illegal search. Mm. And I was in high school at the time, and I think it was it was one of the first moments that I realized that police lie, or some police lie anyway. Um, and that definitely, that experience uh, definitely motivated me to be very interested in studying the law in college. So I knew that I wanted to have uh, some kind of involvement in, in the criminal justice system and in the legal system. Uh, but also I, a number of my friends were involved in, in, at young ages in the juvenile justice system. Some of them went to, to uh, juvenile detention facilities. And so I took a course in college. I think I was taking criminal justice courses, but it was a course at Bucknell, which was called Power and Control in Society. And the professor's name was, was Matthew Silberman. And 
Professor Silverman, if you're out there, you're the name that I forgot to thank in my book, and it haunts me to this day. So thank you for everything. But he was, at the time, doing research in uh, Lewisburg Prison on violence. And um, in his class, one of the units that we talked about with respect to power was total institutions in the form of the prison system. And, and that he really was such a tremendous intellect. And I started thinking about my experiences and the experiences of some of my friends in the context of uh, sociological theory and research. And at one point, he pulled me aside and said, you know, you could pursue a, a PhD in this, which had never occurred to me. And I really wanted to go to law school, but I didn't have the money to go to law school. And he said, and I was like, well, how am I going to, how am I going to afford a PhD? You know, law school's three years and I'm out. I, I don't know how I'm going to go five plus years. And he was like, oh, no, 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 you can get a scholarship to a PhD program. They're much more common than it would be for law school. And so that sort of set me on my uh, trajectory. And I have always, even in graduate school, uh, probably because I was in the prisons. I wasn't uh, collecting survey data. I was mm -hmm. in the prisons doing participant observation research, um, spending time with incarcerated uh, people and their families uh, and advocates. And so it was really incumbent. Even, I think it, it sort of reflects my politics in general that I would have been advocating anyway, but, but it was really incumbent on me not to go into prison and just take in terms of you know, writing a great sociological piece of research, but but also to give back. And so that meant really getting in there. And um, a lot of the work I did in grad school uh, was like on habeas petitions and on petitions for parole and um, wrongful conviction cases. And, uh, you know, I'm not a lawyer by training, but I was filing pro se motions on behalf of uh, death row inmates, on behalf of incarcerated women. And, and so that thread I've really... Um, carried through my work, and uh, and I've started more recently to bring it into the classroom. And I didn't really know how students were going to respond to that at first, but actually it's their enthusiasm that has uh, motivated me to, to make the project much bigger than I initially started out with. And so I'm finding a lot of not just criminology majors, but Villanova students with a variety, you know, like mm -hmm. Villanova students who are business school students and engineering students who are really interested in working on some of these cases and making a real difference in people's lives. And so I'm trying to incorporate it increasingly into my classes as a project where they combine what they know from classes with um, meaningful advocacy work. Wow. Oh, my goodness. Well, you're definitely a role model and um, an you. amazing <laughs> scholar. And no, really, and I've, I've just heard so many, so many things from your your former students, and I really wish I could take it. And I'm I'm taking a gender <laughs> perspectives class though in the spring. Um, oh, that's great. And so hopefully maybe um, you know we're also be we'll be reading some poems and novels. Um, but some of the issues that we've talked about today, um, I I think will be coming up as well in our course. Um, so maybe we can <laughs> we'll see how the conversations translate over. Um, but but thank you so so much for oh, thank for you. joining us today. This is um, fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I have one last question before you leave. Sure. Um, so I, I know that you're, you're by hobby um, <laughs> and passion, um, you're a photographer. Um, and I am somebody that loves photography, very into the arts. Um, and so I think that the arts, you know, I think people know that they bring us closer to um, getting proximate with people um, and, and sharing in, um, you know, more understanding of others in a way that can, you know, go on, go beyond even words. Um, so I wondered how your photography has changed or shaped the way that you see people. Well, I've been a photographer probably since I've been five years old. Yeah. Uh, my grandfather, who was a physicist, introduced me to, to photography, and I went from a point-and-shoot to a SLR in the space of probably a year or two, which is ridiculous. I mean, we just burned through. I can't even imagine how much money in film of my bad, blurry images. Um, but photography for me is um, it's a form of sociology, and it's a form of activism because it does render people of all walks of life visible and and um, and. I never forget anyone I photograph, mm -hmm. even if it's just even if it's a face that I have photographed in passing. And so sometimes when I see people again, I, I always have this kind of moment of I know that person. How do I know that person? And then a lot of times it's because I photograph them just in passing, yeah. but it just um, stays in my head. And I, I think that there is there's an intimacy that comes with it. And also, and I don't uh, want to sound like a hippie, and this is not a statement that I would normally 
make, but I feel like photography makes you realize how beautiful people are yeah. um, and, and really puts people's humanity at the forefront. And so I think that's the, the value and the intrigue for me of photography. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, and thank you, everybody, for joining us today for this episode of the Irish Studies Podcast. Um, you can learn more about Dr. McCorkle and her course offerings um, on her website, and you can also check out her photography there. Um, the website is www.jillmccorkle.com. You can also read um, her much-acclaimed book, Breaking Women, Gender, Race, and New Politics of Imprisonment, and also stay tuned for her forthcoming book that will be exploring the impacts of mass inc incarceration on parents and their children. Children. So thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah.